Okay, thank you very much, um, Kristen. And so welcome everyone to our uh, panel discussion with um, our students today. We're talking about two different things. The first half hour uh, will be the college experience. Um, and so uh, basically we're looking at them to uh, talk about what it's like in the classroom, what it's like using OER, um, both receiving OER, but also maybe using OER um, as uh, assignments if that's happened with the course that they've taken. Um, and what they're doing on campus as far as advocacy and moving OER forward, that's gonna be our second half hour. Um, and so what we'll try and do is I'll, I'll basically have them introduce themselves, kind of give us a little feel uh, and flavor for what, you know, who they are and um, what, they're, what they're doing on campus, maybe what their majors are, whatever they feel like sharing. Um, and then um, once that's done, we'll uh, go back in and talk about um, their experience in the classroom um, or on a course, if it's online, of course, um, whatever the environment might be uh, using OER. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and just uh, pick you guys based on the screen order that I see you. So Cambry, you are, you are first, congratulations. <laughs> so would you mind go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Cambry Canella. I use she, her pronouns. I am a um, senior at Boise State University. I am studying criminal justice with a certificate in human rights. Great, thank you very much. And Pam, you are next. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I'm Pam Piscali. I am a senior in anthropology with a specific in archeological sciences at Idaho State University. Um, and also just really quickly, quickly, I just would like to acknowledge that Idaho State University is on the traditional homelands of the Shoshone Bannock Paiute peoples. Um, and that it's just an important that we pay respects to them and their elders um, of being the caregivers of the land that we are located on. Thank you guys. Great, thank you. And uh, Christian, now you're up. Hi, my name is Christian Gervais, and I am in my second year at College of Western Idaho, and I am studying English with an emphasis in creative writing. Okay, great. Thank you for your introductions. And so, like I said before, this first part is about your experience um, um, in college. And so, um, as that relates mostly to OER, since this is an OER-based virtual conference, but if there's something you'd like to share about a struggle or something um, that you feel okay sharing, um, you know, that relates to that experience, we'd really like to know about it because um, part of why we're all here as instructors and instructional designers and students, faculty and staff, is to figure out where these gaps are and so that we can all work together to, to bridge them using, um, in this case, um, open educational resources or open pedagogy. So um, I'm going to go in reverse order this time and we'll start with um, Christian. Um. So with using OERs and one thing that I think has been really helpful, I think with the struggle of um, moving to more online classes and trying to figure out how to build discussions around literature um, in these times has been really helpful in using OER in order to have a nice consolidated place for everyone to annotate and analyze text and really kind of start building conversations with students and with instructors. And so that's been really uh, impactful and really helpful in kind of overcoming some of the struggles of having more like discussion-based classes online. Yeah. I think, yeah, the, the shift from a traditional format to this hybrid and Zoom environment has definitely, um, I think brought up the issue of open resources more to the forefront of students who maybe haven't had it before. I haven't had it utilized very often in many of my courses. Every once in a while, it'll be something small, um, you know, like a workbook that the teachers created and that's free. But um, generally all of, all of my classes have had traditional textbooks um, or, you know, the, the academic journals that we get from the library. So I haven't had a lot of experience in classroom with it. Um, but I am on the, the Idaho State University's OER committee, and we just had our week of events. So I got to learn a lot through that, but not a lot in classroom yet. Okay, thank you. Um, Amber. Yeah, so um, like I said, I'm getting a certificate in human rights. And 
we, in all my coursework for the certificate, we talk about um, traditional like inequities across um, America. And so in order to kind of um, practice what's being taught in the classroom, I have um, received a lot of OER throughout my time in this like certificate program. Um, so one of my professors, I'm in my capstone for their certificate right now, and she um, recorded all of her guest speakers, guest advocates from last semester before COVID hit. Um, and now we get that same education that those folks got um, without actually having to interact with these folks or have them come to our class because she has this whole video library um, of advocates that we can all watch. So it's been so helpful and it really just creates such an inclusive classroom where everyone can get the same information and knowledge despite um, your background or where you're coming from or how much money you have to spend on absurdly expensive textbooks. Okay, great. And so that brings me to a little activity I want uh, everyone to participate in. So if I can have, not the panelists, not the students, but everybody who's watching or listening, if you have access to the chat right now, why don't you put a number in of what you think these these, these students, our, our panel, might have paid for a book, a single book, maybe the most expensive book. Um, so go ahead and put that in the chat right now, just a number. So, okay, so we have 175, 150, 100, 250, 350, more expensive, 450. Wow, okay, all right. Okay, so um, now, panelists, um, go ahead and unmute yourself. What is the average cost of your textbook? Not the most expensive, but just the average cost. Do you think? Um, I think that the, the average cost for an, for an actual textbook, not like a supplementary material or um, you know something like that, I think the average is, is close to you know, over 200, 225, I guess. Wow, okay, for especially, you. Especially it, when you hit your upper division courses, you know, those get, those get very expensive. So I buy a lot of supplemental books, you know, that are regular books that are 30 and 40 and $50, but I think an actual textbook um, is quite high. Okay. Yeah, in my experience, I would say that on average, it, textbook is about 180 to 200 dollars on average mm -hmm. on average so you've spent more than that on the I've spent more than that yeah but that's about ballpark range for most of them okay Amber, you feel like sharing with us yeah i'm kind of on the lower end i don't know if it's because it's social science or criminal justice or i just have nice professors um but i think mine is typically around like 50 dollars on average okay and maybe that's because Cambry uh, has more of the OER in, in her in her classroom in her. That could be because <laughs> it's her major, right? It's, I would I admit mean, that might be. Yeah, and we actually, we did a survey here at ISU. Um, we got just about 80 responses. And the average, we asked students, um, what's the most expensive book? So the average of their most expensive book is closer to 360 is the average of their most expensive. Wow, so that's, su that's surprising to me. Um, and I've been in OER circles for maybe five, six years. <laughs> um, uh, and and there, there have been surveys that we've done at Boise State um, throughout the years. And um, so this is still, yeah, this is still, you know, an issue, a big issue, especially for students. Um, and so, uh, you know, thank you for being willing to share that information with us. So um, what, beyond textbooks, do you, do you all recall um, a free access to, or no, not having to have a web password or an access code that you had to pay for that allowed you to have some type of ancillary material access? So an assignment, a video, a, a document, an article. Um, and was that plugged to you or sold to you or not sold, but like, uh, presented to you as something that is open education, uh, an open educational resource? Okay, so let me ask you this. Have you watched a TED Talk as part of a course um, lecture or, or, or assignment? 
Oh yeah. Awesome. Oh, you're all three nine. Okay. So <laughs> I, I would consider that to be open educational resource and um, because it, it's free, um, it's licensed in an open way. Um, and so um, there, there, there are ways that, that OER is creeping in, 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 in other ways, and just besides the textbook, and it's good to hear, and I wanted to check and make sure that that's happening. I know it's happening in some of my um, colleagues' courses here at Boise State. All right, so um, what I'd like to know now, um, and we've got, we're about halfway through this first topic. When you talk to your fellow students, your, your classmates, your peers, do they know what OER is? Do they have an understanding of it at all, you think? No? Okay. So now, tell me, and if I'm the one that introduced you to OER, I don't think I am, because I emailed you to be on the panel, or someone else did. That's fine. Um, but did you, how did you come to know about OER? Um, I think, uh, I see, I didn't realize, and before I started on the committee, I didn't realize things like TED Talks would technically be considered OER, um, you know, things like that. And I do see those creeping into the classroom, especially now that we're in the Zoom universe, that teachers are finding um, more supplemental things like that to, to add in that are free or found online. Um, but before that, I, before this year, I don't think I really understood that that was an option like I knew that some people were doing that themselves for their classes to make it kind of customized and accessible, but I didn't know it was this whole community sphere of things that have been happening for quite a while. Okay, and so then, um, Kristen or Cambry? Yeah, just kind of soundboarding off uh, Pam, I think, yeah, with that context of more of those things being a broader version of OER, I think, um, it's been happening for some time without me realizing it, but yeah, I really found out last semester in classrooms where we had a teacher who really promoted it and used an open source textbook. Okay. Yeah, I um, have served in student government for the past two years, and that's where I found out about it. Um, our last administration was super passionate about OER. I think he worked with our vice president, Mikhail Melter, a lot. Um, and uh, they had a little panel last year um, that I attended and learned so much. And I don't think I've ever heard the term OER in the classroom. Like no one's ever used that term to describe the uh, content that we're using, um, but it's exactly what the content is. Um, it's just not labeled as that. So it was super insightful and um, I just think it's a really great resource. Okay, thank you for that little bit of information um, as far as that's concerned. So I, and you're right, uh, Cambry, I, 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 we've been very fortunate at Boise State to have for the last several student government administrations have been very, I would say very active in figuring out what OER is, how, how it can be used best to serve the students um, and so forth. So that leads me to my next question is how, um, so if you're not, if you're peers aren't really talking about it too much. Maybe Cambry's student government peers are talking about it. Um, but if you were to, the old adage, you get what you, you know, you've heard it, you, you get what you pay for, meaning that if it's free, it's probably not that usable or valuable. Um, but, um, and so that's a, that's a myth and that's a concern with OER. Um, and so how, how would you guys interpret that idea within the OER universe? as students? Yeah, I, I think that um, as students, and I'm on the older end of the students <laughs> currently, but um, I think as far as students go, uh, we're much more receptive to using free materials. I don't think that we feel like it's free, therefore it is cheap material or it, it's not as valuable material. I think growing up, in the internet age, we know the kind of resources that are out there and we understand that people put a lot of work into things that are there. So being online and free and open doesn't necessarily to us equate to um, less than or not as good. And I think that's, that's probably just a generational shift. And I feel like, you know, in the older end of the spectrum of faculty, they're probably more in the mindset of how do I know this is vouched for? How do I know this is going to be good material? You know, 
things like that. So I definitely feel like with the students I've talked to um, and the students we interviewed, there's much more of a shift towards um, you know, appreciating the, the online format and things like that. Any other comments? I think um, in this year of a pandemic, um, our education in general is just kind of less valuable being on Zoom. So we're still paying the same amount to attend a university. Um, so I think it's nice when you can use resources that you don't have to pay for on top of what you're already paying for to go to school from your bedroom um, and get that same education. And you can still have the same discussions and um, that kind of interaction on Zoom, but with a free resource that is not an additional cost. Yeah, you know, that's exactly um, kind of the sentiment here at CWI as well. You, you got students that they're looking already to find the cheapest options of everything um, because that's just, yeah, where we're at. And so I think free educational resources are usually more exciting for them than not. And they're not too concerned about quality. <laughs> yeah, so, and then, oh, sorry, I was just going to comment on, on Cambry's comment of, you know, being on online and on zoom and things are already weird um i feel like our instructors are in this spot where being online um having students struggling with all these new things you know and, and new um hurdles to get over to to get access to what they need because you know so many people are are struggling with jobs and everything else in healthcare. i think that instructors are much more willing now to investigate oer because they're looking for any ways they can to help keep their students engaged online. And they know people are in all sorts of weird spaces and predicaments right now. So the issue is much more salient right now. And I think it's kind of prime time to really get people talking about it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I thank you for sharing that information and you can see that the comments are coming, you know, in quite rapidly, um, which are, those are good comments and good things. And we'll get to these uh, things in the chat room in just a minute. So, but I want to focus on cost because you guys are still, you guys are focusing on that as well. And we're going to get to a change in what other things OER and how other things are um, maybe beneficial or benefiting from the use of OER. But um, so if you have a choice between an instructor who uses OER and an instructor who doesn't, either through word of mouth or through some type of indication on the registration you know, form that you fill out before the semester starts, even if you think um, that you know, there might be some other pluses to, to the other person's class, like my friend says it's an easy A, but they don't use OER. So there's two conflicts for students there. Um, but the person who uses OER is a slightly harder class. Which wins, the easy A or the no cost textbook? Do you think, for, your, for you and your peers, you can answer in general. I think if it's an upper division class, um, I think most of my peers in my department would pick the harder class with the, the free resources. Um, because what we've seen from it is the, the access to things like instructional videos, and shared study sheets and those workbooks that come with it for free that supplement everything else that I don't know if it, it equates to being a harder class always how we think of it because we have all these extra resources that come with it um, and that really kind of heightens the experience and, and what we take away from it. I think definitely, especially in upper division courses, like once you get to a certain level I don't know about you all, but like for me, there's only so much within the criminal justice system. Um, like the system is set in place. It's not really going anywhere. Um, so once you get to a certain level, you kind of are aware of most of the general things that you're going to be educated on throughout your time in your um, undergraduate degree. And so I think OER is really nice because it switches it up from what you may have been traditionally doing. Um, and also you get a free resource um, that you don't have to pay for and everyone can use it and share conversation and discussion about that. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's definitely like in choosing the OER, which I think um, most of my peers would, it just offers a diverse learning experience. And I think it's 
different. It's new. It's more exciting than traditional textbook stuff. So I think just the excitement and the challenge of trying something different is something that is a big factor in those choices. Okay. Well, thank you. So I'm going to, I'm going to, we didn't plan this, but we got to talk about diversity as well. And so it's good that you mentioned diverse learning experience. Um, so Mo, I would say that most instructors I've come across, speaking from the instructor side of things, are concerned about quality uh, and do spend a lot of time either finding and or vetting what they found and, and so forth before they put it to your class, whether it's from a traditional uh, publishing source, whether it's a web uh, resource that the publisher is providing, or whether it's um, an OER text or an OER video or some type of free licensed, uh, freely licensed um, ancillary materials or, or homeworks or, or even a canned uh, video or lecture. Um, they're really going to take those things seriously um, and before they present them to you, for, in, in, for the most part, uh, it would be very rare I find a professor who <laughs> doesn't really do the time to uh, vet those things. So, um, and, and you know, there are going to be some things like Wikipedia is an open source, but we all know that Wikipedia maybe might be a good starting point if you know nothing about the subject and you can branch out from there and look at the sources and begin to see who is an expert in this field and why they're an expert. And then you start reading their papers on their primary sources and you get away from things like Wikipedia. Um, so there, there are, there, that is a concern. Um, but back to the diversity um, issue. So one of the really cool things about open educational resources is it doesn't um, hinder the author um, because anybody can put anything out on the web, right? So, um, which is why there needs, everything needs to be vetted. But um, the traditional publishing process can um, cause um, BIPOCs, by, you know, um, Black, Indigenous people of color, uh, women, um, LGBT authors to have to go through a lot of extra hurdles and hoops that others may not have to go through to get their work out um, to talk about something, to have an opinion expressed. And so um, when you think of OER, is it just because it's low cost or does the diversity uh, aspect really play into your thinking as well? And what would you, what do you have to say about that? Um, I think on the diversity aspect, the nice thing about OER is the fact that it is online. It can change constantly it's always evolving it's always updating um so i think having something that is in real time reflecting where we're at as a culture um and always kind of ahead of the curve instead of like older textbooks that have things that you're like eh, i don't know about this um it's definitely nice to have that in the oer resource yeah um i think that um Again, growing up in the digital age, we understand that things on blogs, things on Wikipedia um, are different than things we find in uh, free access academic journals and things like that. And so I think um, students understand that, but those, those things like blog posts and non-traditional um, you know, academics in a sense, they're still just as valuable to us. I think it's really important that um, teachers and faculty have access to and will willing to incorporate those kind of materials for us because there's so much globalization happening right now and so many of these important movements are happening that you know it's not in books and so to find the people who are their experts in the fields who maybe aren't academics traditionally and use them in the, in the classroom is really important. It's 11 o'clock. I'm going to jump in real quick here. It is 11 o'clock. We're not going to take a break. We're going to push right on through, go to our second topic. Um, so thank you for hanging with us. But I do want to get it, uh, to Cambry's thoughts on the diversity issue. So Cambry, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think representation in the classroom really matters. And when you're getting a diverse um, voice and diverse sources to use within your classroom, I think that's extremely important because a lot of published textbooks are just written by folks who are traditionally privileged. Um, and when you're in a classroom and you're reading books by white men over and over again, 
um, you're only kind of getting, you can, you can only be getting one um, sort of rhetoric and one point of view. So I think that representation and the ability to use diverse um, individuals and opinions and thoughts and backgrounds is um, extremely valuable at OER. Thank you all for that opinion. And I have a question for you now. Um, we're gonna start to transition into advocacy uh, for OER and what students can do, what maybe you've thought of doing um, and what, we, what, what you can ask of faculty and staff to do as well. Um, but I wanna stick with diversity and equity and inclusion for just a bit longer. Um, I'm gonna tell a little bit of a little story. Um, so when I teach, um, you know, I teach at Boise State. Most of my students are white. Um, but but wait, there are some you know, diverse students, um, and I'm not talking about just BIPOC, but disability, um, maybe people, um, different religious um, persuasions and, and, and beliefs. Um, and a long time ago, I went to a workshop and it said, hey, when you have a guest speaker, when you have a video, don't just put people that look like you because you are the you, you are, and I, in my case, I do represent the dominant culture very much so, white, male, heterosexual. And so they're gonna get that opinion from me all day long. But what I can do is bring in somebody else who doesn't look like me, who maybe has a different opinion than I do, who maybe has a different background than I do. Um, and that, uh, you know, opens up a conversation. It does make it more interesting for the instructor, at least I think it does. Um, but I was doing it because at the time it was a nice thing to do, I thought, um, until I started getting my reviews from my students. So, you know, at the end of the course, there's a course evaluation and, and most students don't necessarily fill them out, but some do. Um, and I got a, a review from a couple of students that appreciated that. Um, and I thought, oh, wow, you know, it's, this is a thing. People are noticing this. Um, but it wasn't until a student of mine came up to me who um, was online, but was a person who's on campus, but took the class online and came up to me. But at first I didn't recognize because, you know, different environment. And uh, she was BIPOC and she said, Mr. Casper, Mr. Casper, I loved your class. And I was gonna quit my, change my major and quit my degree because I didn't think I could do what, 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 what it was, you know, that we, we were teaching until you had an example of someone who looked like me doing it. And um, I was with two colleagues and um, it was just such a cool moment. We were going to lunch um, and that kind of was, a, you know, it was a really a big moment for me. It changed my point of view and made it real. Um, so if, um, so I say this to get to this question, when an instructor does have diversity in the class, whether it's OER or not, but more than likely, I think it's going to be some type of open thing Although the publishers are getting better, they are behind this uh, idea within the OER, OER community, I think is a little bit more advanced uh, in this area. Um, how, how would you suggest students share um, that that meant something to them? How would they express that this was a good thing, we need to move forward uh, I, I appreciate seeing more of this. What's a, I mean, obviously talking to the professor, doing the evaluation at the end of the course, but is there some other way that that can be expressed so that the instructor knows that this had an impact on their instruction for the specific student, but maybe the entire class or the curriculum? Yeah, I think, um, you know, student, the end of the semester surveys are really important because not just the instructor sees those, you know, I know the others in the administration see those as well, and they're used for their kind of evaluation of the teacher. And I think a lot of students um, are more likely to speak up in class and just say, I really enjoyed this presenter. Um, I, you know, I really re resonate with their point of view. I appreciate having them. But besides that, I don't know, I'm sure Cambria has done some stuff with um, her student government here at ISU, our student government, government is passing a resolution of support for OER and kind of touching on why it's important to include those um, marginalized voices in the classroom so that not only are those people, their point of view presented to the classroom on the subject, but also it's more relatable for other students who are already coming into higher ed. Um, I think a lot of time with my major in specific, um, 
we're talking about folks who are incarcerated and folks who are traditionally marginalized and incarcerated at higher rates. And most of we, I attend Boise State, a predominantly white university. Most of my professors are white and they don't have, obviously they're extremely passionate and have tons of knowledge about these things, um, but they don't have the experience. And so having folks that you can see firsthand um, who have experienced these things, I think is just so incredibly impactful to your education. Um, no matter what you're studying, having folks that are directly doing this work or a part of this or experience this is so just like insightful um, moving forward because obviously academics have so much information, but you can't have a lived experience if you haven't had it. So um, I don't know. I think just, I think it's important for professors to also like reach out for um, feedback. Like my professor that has advocates come talk to our course, like after every single advocate, she, we have like a discussion um, about what they, like what we thought of them and like their story and everything. And so I think that's nice because I think sometimes students are hesitant to reach out themselves and say like, I liked this or I didn't like this, but opening the conversation I think is extremely helpful. Yeah, I like that idea, Cambry. I am definitely going to relay that to my instructors, um, the idea of having an after speaker kind of quick survey. Um, Cause I, I have a couple of teachers who are really good at incorporating these BIPOC voices in the classroom. Um, and I've kind of, I've expressed them like, hey, I really appreciate this. Like, it's really interesting, especially in the field of anthropology, um, we're, we're traditionally a colonizer discipline. So, you know, we can't ever get away from that colonizer discipline and heritage of that if we don't start incorporating these voices. So I'm going to, I'm going to borrow that idea and I'm going to tell them because I think that, that's a really cool way to get feedback immediately. Yeah, I'm on the same page. I think that's really great. Um, being able to have that open conversation of being exposed to those different viewpoints, what that does for our learning experience. Um, I think that's something that would be really beneficial in the classroom. Okay. Well, thank you all. Um, and I'm, I'm going to kind of move into a different, different direction here. Um, but we're going to try and keep incorporating all our previous discussion ideas as we move forward here. So, um, when you think of the ways to advocate for yourself, um, for your uh, peers, for your discipline, um, what are ways that you can push OER in a productive way um, to an instructor as a student? What do you think the, those, what ideas do you have? So that, in other words, what I'm saying is that you have an instructor you need to take this class to graduate, um, but they're not using OER. Um, how do you have that discussion just to ask them in, a, in you know, a polite way, how does that work? You know, how do you, how do you address that as a student? I know how I do it as an instructional designer and a faculty member, but it might be different because the power dynamic is going to be different. So that's what I'm getting at. So how, and, and what I'm really trying to get at is I want the people who are watching this to see that, and probably most of them are here because they're already part of the OER course, but we, what I wanna see is we may not recognize when a student asks us for something. We may think, oh, that's nice, they're talking to us. <laughs> um, and sometimes we don't understand really what they're getting at or what they're asking for. So how would you approach the instructor? And then how could, what would you ask of the instructors to do um, to take that feedback? Um, I have really, really awesome instructors and um, a lot of them encourage like myself and my classmates to like email them interesting things that are happening or like things relevant to our course. Um, so obviously OER is extremely like available to us. Um, so maybe like sending them something that has to do with like the coursework um, that is an open educational resource and just saying like, hey, like I found this, I think would be really awesome to like incorporate it into our course. Um, I think that's a good way to go about it. And like, obviously professors love when you're getting involved and um, care about what care about what's going on in the class. So just that kind of like approachable, um, just like a little email and encouraging them to um, incorporate more OER in the classroom. Great. Yeah. yeah, I think that's huge. 
Um, definitely in my experience, if I've had a teacher that has shared an OER experience, maybe without thinking too much about it, um, if it resonates with you, you know, I think it's definitely really nice to email them and be like, hey, this was a really useful tool for me. And same thing, I think building that rapport and that sort of uh, relationship where you can share things are like, Hey, I found this. What do you, you know, and kind of build that communication. Yeah. I think, um, one other thing as, as instructors, um, point of view, something to look out for maybe, you know, because I know, I know students who would be worried about the power dynamic and maybe they're struggling already with the financial burdens or something of school and they might not feel comfortable coming and saying, Hey, I really need this class. I really want to take your class, but you know, I'm broke, but you know, um, so I think key looking for keywords, you know, cause they might not come across and say it, but if they're, if they're talking to the instructor about, um, costs of school or, costs of material, or if they ask you, hey, do you, like I've had students ask teachers already, um, do you know where I can find this online? You know, things like that. Um, I think, look for the hints because they might not come out and say it. Um, they might not be willing to share, or you might not already be in the classroom where they are sharing resources they found, but instructors should keep an eye out for any of these hints. If they're sharing resources with you that are open and free and good, and you know, if they're asking for flexibility in the materials or um, if you have a copy that they can borrow, if, if the library has a copy they can borrow, things like that I, might be a subtle way that students are trying to ask you, um, you know, for more of those resources because they generally want to be in your classroom, but they maybe can't always afford it. And it might not be that your book is breaking their wallet, but it might be the combined cost of everything is hard. So. Okay. Um, and so there's something else in addition to OER or an OER text. Obviously, we've talked about videos and OER assignments and, and other ancillary stuff for a course. Um, but there's also a concept called open pedagogy. And open pedagogy, one of the ideas for open pedagogy is not only using open uh, course materials to push to the students, but then it's also um, assigning OER assignments to get back from the students. So instead of writing a report, for instance, that is only going to be seen by the instructor and then it's going to be graded and then really deleted or thrown in the trash um, after you get it back, um, you know, and you might, you might keep it if it's your major and if it's a big capstone, you know, for a portfolio if you did well on it, but really no one else sees it. Um, but sometimes there are instructors who have you do a poster session that have you, that, that goes also online, that has you do some type of project that is community facing, that um, is intended and maybe don't officially license it with an open license, but is intended to live on outside of the classroom. And others can then take that work next semester and say, hey, Pam did this project, you know, at ISU and, um, you know, Christian goes, I'm going to take that project and I'm going to do, you know, add this to it and add that to it. Um, have you guys had any, any experiences like that so far? Or do you think that that might be a good thing? I've had, um, I have one instructor who is really good at the, the open pedagogy. Um, and I don't always recognize it straight away. But <laughs> then when I hear other people talk about it, I start picking up on more things I notice she does in the classroom. And one of the things she does is have us make websites mm -hmm. for our larger projects, whether they're group projects or individual projects. She has us make websites for them with, you know, the references and everything on there. And it, even if it's a poster session, she has us put the poster online with our references, with a blurb, with the abstract. Um, and I think that's really helpful because then of course she can pull up her past students and say, look, they're on here like we can build off of theirs we can kind of see you know this one is close to the format or the thing i'm doing and so build off of that and have that as kind of like um, a starting point instead of just starting fresh from your own brain and another thing that that's not really open um 
in the sense that it lives forever online, but we do in Zoom, we do um, presentations there and then they, we record them and we save them there so that we can go back later and part of our class is like, go back now, rewatch somebody else's presentation that you know more about now. And then let's add to the discussion. Um, and that comes in handy when we, at the end, we create um, like a study guide for our final writing assignments. So that's really helpful. And it would be amazing to see that kind of stuff living online. Um, this is a small step in between, I guess, but I really like those resources. Um, yeah, one experience I've had with an instructor at CWI is for our final project. Uh, it's actually Joel, he's here. We did what is called the Unessay project where for American Lit, it was a creative response to the material. Um, and most of it was cool to see people take those projects and put them on the online format of like, say they, you know, responding to Walden, you can make an Instagram feed kind of based on that. And it's creating these artifacts online that is engaging with the material as well as kind of being able to expose to more people of like, hey, this is how this material resonated with me. And I think there was a really cool way to um, like, yeah, respond to that material and do a creative response with it and put it somewhere where it's going to live for a long time and be something you can go back to. Yeah, I've um, enjoyed hearing both of your experiences. I have never um, really experienced anything like that. There's never really anything that I've done that um, has lived somewhere after. I'd always just submit the essay and then it just lives on your desktop until you delete it. Um, so yeah, I appreciate your experiences, but I've never, never had an experience like that. That's good to know, Cambry. I'll be talking to people in criminal justice. Um, <laughs> but, um, so let me ask you this. Um, this may seem like an easy answer, but I just want it on record. If you were to write an essay or something, even a poster, that only the instructor is going to grade and give back to you, or you're going to do something that's going to be online and others are going to see it in the community, which assignment do you enjoy doing and have more engagement with? Definitely online stuff. And, um, be and because I think those kind of assignments are much more flexible and creative than just uh, an essay that we submit and then it lives rent-free on our desktop. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, I was just thinking of a, another assignment that I'm in the middle of doing, which is it's going to be a Twitch stream where we play um, video games relating to climate change in some way. And then we talk about climate change in the Intermountain West. And so it's a creative assignment and we're going to stream it online and I invite our class and hopefully maybe somebody else will stumble across it and we can, you know, ask our friends to jump in and people ask us questions. So the, the audience is asking us questions while we're, we're going through and playing this game and also kind of pausing to say, oh, this is interesting. Look at this example. Here's how it relates to maybe our environment. So I think that I would definitely like the online ones better because they usually are much more creative and um, you know, open to student interpretations. Okay, well, I just wanted to get that on record. I mean, it's generally thought that students enjoy it and uh, those assignments, they're better for their um, uh, engagement and motivation uh, in general. And um, it's, it, it acts as a way of building a public facing portfolio. So when you go for a job or an interview, uh, for an internship or something like that, that's something that can be helpful as well. So most students would, would, would say what you all have said um, or agree or whatever with that type of an assignment. But the reason I bring that up in this half hour is because those open pedagogy assignments that others can see are the number one way of advocating for OER because you're creating OER, other people see it and get this, the instructors who aren't using it, but see those poster sessions and see those uh, websites and see those different games and ancillary, they go, oh, maybe I should be doing this too in my class. And all of a sudden we've got a convert, um, someone who's interested in doing OER. So open pedagogy is a tool for advocacy as well as student engagement and 
um, student, you know, stronger student buy-in to the course material. Um, so good to hear. Um, and I want it, we have like five minutes left and I'm sorry everyone for leaving only five minutes. But, and you've been good um, talking about the, the attendees um, and putting in questions and comments in the chat. We really, I really appreciate that. The chat should be available after the, the talk as well uh, or the panel. But um, I wanted to make sure that I left more time uh, for uh, our um, attendees to come up with additional questions or concerns that, that we have not addressed during this time. Um, and we've covered a, a broad topic uh, and rather quickly, obviously we can each sub topic within the, you know, each question could be its own workshop or, um, you know, panel discussion here today. Um, but it's great that we get to hear a student perspective. Um, and so now's your chance, um, attendees, if you'd rather um, type something in chat and I'll go ahead and relay it or the students can just address it directly. Um, Please let us know if there's something that I have missed um, that you'd like to address. Uh, students, if you would go ahead and look through the chat real quick, I think we've covered the different topics that have come up, but if there's something that sparks interest, um, go ahead and, and, and now's your time to address that. We have a little bit of silence, that, that uncomfortable Zoom silence. I can see the um, Q&A question that asks about um, screen time. And um, I honestly prefer, maybe just because I've grown up in a digital age, but prefer um, like reading and doing things on my computer versus having a physical book, um, like a textbook, because you can highlight and you can annotate it um, and not have to rent it from Amazon and like send it back in perfect condition. Um, and then you kind of always have that um, wherever you store it or if it's on a website or something um, that you can refer back to and use maybe in later coursework. Um, so I think, I think screen time is a big issue right now, but like it's just inevitable. Like I'm on my computer all day working, doing school um, and I'm sure most of you all are too. So um, Maybe once we're out of this pandemic, <laughs> we will all have less screen time, but I personally enjoy um, doing my work on my screen. Yeah, I prefer to, if it's small things like um, articles and stuff, I'll print them out and highlight them. Um, but I always prefer the, the online format so that I have the option. There's a lot of things, um, a lot of books and, and supplemental materials that I'm not going to keep forever. I don't need forever. Um, and there, you know, there are other things that I really would like to have in hard copy, but the, the option is always really nice. Um, yeah, I think Jesse, yeah, finding new ways to mitigate screen time, like in other areas, since I spent a lot of time on it for school, um, you know, definitely try and schedule more breaks, just be more intentional with my time. Um, but yeah, for the most part, I would say having it all online is easiest for just organization. It's all right there. It's all really accessible. So. Okay. Yeah. Great. Oh, did you, have, did you have something else to add? Well, I was just going to, I saw the, the question that um, somebody asked, do CWI students choose classes that are low cost? or use OER over other courses? Um, is there some kind of code that indicates when you register? And I thought that was interesting because we've, I've talked about that with my committee. Um, currently, we don't have, at ISU, we don't have anything that indicates that it's OER when you're looking at it or in the catalog or registering for it. But I think just to put that out there, it would be really helpful for students if it showed up and not like click the button, it's like, oh, there's no textbooks because we don't know if that's real or if they're gonna be added later. <laughs> But having the kind of code that says this is OER, I think would really incentivize students to prefer that class over other things. Thank you all. We're at time. And I know I just want to add that, and I'm sure Cambry is nodding her head yes, because BSU has been trying to do that for years as well. Um, so, but thank you all for your time, for your information, for your um, for willing to be here and share your perspectives with us is very valuable. Uh, we've got a lot of comments on there. I'm going to wrap up by saying that um, my email is available uh, to anyone who um, 
has an OER concern, whether you be BSU or not, it's on the webpage for the conference. Um, and I can get a hold of, of the students for you if you have a, a follow-up question as well. So just go ahead and email me and I, I can address that. Thank you all so much. And um, we have a five minute break before our next session, which is um, the OER, our Library Commission for Libraries, OER and Statewide Digital Equity um, with Stephanie Bailey White. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, everybody. That was excellent.